Naughty. 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 By and large, I think things turn out pretty well. Hearing the language that I had come up with on the screen in the final version of the film was, as you might imagine, a very special feeling. But in a sense, what's happened to Navi post-Avatar is, at least for me, maybe the most exciting thing of all. It's a semikyun kopuk. People are actually using it for genuine communication. There are a couple of instances of Navi learners in different parts of the world who don't share any other common language except Navi. So, I mean, that's something I frankly did not anticipate. And at this point, I'm working very closely with the community to develop the language for it. Listen, always, always. I get long emails written to me entirely in Navi to get people fired up about the wonders of language, whether it's human language or whether it's language of the Navi, I, I'm, I'm just tickled. All right, great. Wonderful, Professor Frommer. Great job you have done, wonderful. Thank so I now officially Not welcome you. Yeah. Uh, to our meeting and we've got uh, people from all over the world with John here. John, hi, how are you? Good to have you with us. Good morning, good morning. Lovely yeah, to have you. Thank you. Okay, uh, good morning to everyone. The floor is yours, Professor Krashen. It's an honor for us that you're going to chair this meeting <coughs> if possible. Thank you. Uh, I, I should tell you right away, I've had some problems with Paul Fromer in the past. We, we've never really gotten along, and I'll tell you why, okay? First of all, let's compare our careers where Paul always came out ahead of me, and I'm getting pretty tired of it. Um, I started out in majoring in mathematics. I had to change my major. It was too hard. Paul, of course, finished his degree in mathematics. Um, I play the piano. I'm kind of a piano player. Paul plays the piano for real. He plays Beethoven sonatas, which I can never touch. In fact, he's finishing up mastering the Waldstein, which is great. I play popular songs. Paul speaks most of the languages I do, and some I don't. As you heard in the um, little segment, he acquired the Malaysian language in the Peace Corps and actually taught in it. Oh, my gosh. Now, I acquired some Amharic in Ethiopia. And when I try to order coffee, they just stare at me and then they start <laughs> laughing. Paul's work has been featured on national public radio. Beautiful wow. review. My work was criticized last year on national public radio. Thanks a lot, Paul. <laughs> we both have a background in weightlifting, pumping iron, in different branches of Gold's Gym. I pretend that I trained with Arnold Schwarzenegger, but in reality, I only said hello to him a few times. But Paul actually trained with one of the heroes of bodybuilding, Mr. Universe Bill Pearl, now 89 years old and looking good. Everyone, wow. everyone tells me what a nice guy Paul is. How am I supposed to feel? It even happened to me today from my daughter, okay? She called up this evening, and I told her I was going to get on the computer and introduce Paul Fromer. Guess what she said? Oh, Paul, what a nice guy. And her husband, Glenn, shouted out, oh, yeah, Paul, say hi to him. What a brilliant nice guy. So we all go to the same party every year, et cetera. Um, Nushan, uh, Stari met Paul this year. Guess what she told me? What a nice guy he is. Okay. I I've know. Actually, <laughs> I know, I know. I've actually <laughs> heard Paul speak several times. And not just on language, but on other topics. Unlike me, he can talk about other things. <laughs> and I must admit, he's really good. And I have to admit, He's a really nice guy. Um, here's a little known fact, uh, the nature of coincidence. Paul not only invented the Navi language, but he also invented the Barsoom language from the John Carter of Mars books, <clears throat> written by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Hmm. Dushan, guess where Edgar Rice Burroughs lived? 
Tarzana. Is that a coincidence or what? Where there is, of course, an Iranian community, okay? Now, we must have something that came up in the film, which I think bears repetition. We have to say, include a word about a mutual friend of ours. If it wasn't for him, this never would have happened, and the world would not be nearly as good a place, in my opinion. James Cameron, Paul told you, you heard on the thing, called the USC Department of Linguistics, uh, looking for someone to develop a language for a movie. Mm -hmm. It was Paul. Fortunately for Paul, fortunately for the movie industry, and as you're going to hear, fortunately for linguistics. It's been a mm -hmm. wonderful, wonderful thing. The best thing I can say, or even better thing I can say about Paul, never run out of good things. Living in Southern California, I meet a lot of actors. I have seen them in movies. And they're so professional. This is a mark of a professional actor. You forget their real identities. You know, oh, that's my friend Justin Bieber. Oh, not really. Uh, <laughs> we, and you, you're absorbed into the movie. That's a real actor. The same thing happened to me when I saw Avatar in the theater. I forgot that was Paul's language. Oh, what did he do here with the verb? Nothing like that. I was pulled into the movie 100% completely convincing. Ladies and gentlemen, our hero and friend of Linguin, Booster of Linguistics, we owe him so much, Paul Frummer. Here, here. Well, this is a great pleasure and a great honor, and I thank my very good friend Steve for uh, his unmerited but certainly appreciated words. I mean, I think, I think we all realize that Steve is being overly modest and although i may have done something which has gotten uh, a fair amount of press uh steve's work has been extraordinarily significant and is going to have a great impact on something that we all care about deeply which is language acquisition and language instruction so um with that uh i'll say again it's i'm really delighted to be here and thank you all for, for coming at various times and in various places, various parts of the world. And um, let me see now if I can share my screen. Um, I'd like to remain in voice contact with the least students. You can give us some feedback and just make sure that everything's okay. Okay, so let me try this. Okay, now uh, at this point, let me do that. Let me do this. Okay, does everyone everyone see that? No. Uh, not yet, not for me. Okay. No, neither here. No one no one has anything yet? No. No. Because I just I've just shared my screen and I can Hmm. I wonder why. So wh what are you seeing actually on your screen? The same yes. thing, actually. Uh, uh, you and Professor Krashen. Yeah. It hasn't changed? No. Uh, okay, well, oh, start sharing. I, I don't think I pressed start sharing. <laughs> Let me try this. <laughs> How's that? There it is. You got it? There it is. Okay, ah. very good. Awesome. Very good. Yeah, yeah, we've got it. We've got it. Fantastic. Okay, okay. well, um, I was anticipating this would take something like maybe 45 minutes or so. Um, let, let's kind of see how it goes. I would really like to reserve a fair amount of time afterwards, after my, uh, my presentation for a discussion, because uh, I'm gonna be very selfish and I would love to get your ideas about something that's important to me, which I'll, I'll tell you about in just a little while. So, um, what I was thinking about for tonight is to talk about these things kind of in order. First of all, how we got the job, and you've already heard quite a bit about that, so I'm going to go through that very quickly. Uh, then, uh, since we're all interested in language, I thought we'd take more of an in-depth look at what the language itself is like, the structure, um, the, the kind of the, the elements that went into it, what makes it, uh, what makes it unique. 
I'll say a little bit about working with the actors, what that experience was like. Um, and then in that little video, what happened to Navi after Avatar was perhaps the most satisfying thing of all to me. So I'll talk about uh, some of the new ventures that the language uh, has appeared in, and also about the Lit Fiarolo, which is the language community. And these are the fans who have uh, embraced the language and made it their own and uh, made it an extremely satisfying experience for me. And finally, um, and this is what I wanted to discuss. Um, what are the challenges of teaching a conlang? Conlang is the term that's developed for constructed CON language, constructed language conlang. So um, with that outline in mind, let me first talk about how I got the job. Now, you have already been introduced to this gentleman, uh, and very rightly so. So um, I'll just reiterate that this <laughs> is Dr. Edward Finnegan, who is Emeritus Professor of Linguistics and Law at USC, which is my university, University of Southern California. Uh, Ed has been extraordinarily important in the lives of many people, but especially important from my point of view in my life. He's, um, he's been a teacher, he's been a mentor, uh, and he's become a close personal friend. Um, it's fair to say no one has had a greater influence on the development of my professional life than Ed. Uh, we first met in 1971, so we're talking almost 50 years ago, um, when um, my husband John and I moved from New York to Los Angeles, and I was about to begin my graduate work. At the time, Ed was chair of the linguistics department at USC. Of course, across town, there was a fairly well-known competing department at UCLA, and it was very persuasive in... Um, in letting me know that I would do far better at USC. And so I became a, a linguistics graduate student at USC. I've never regretted that decision. It was also my first linguistics professor and perhaps the most inspiring one of all. Um, and then a few years after that, Ed was the one responsible for me getting to Iran. It was 1975 and I was presumably working on my dissertation getting nowhere. Uh, at the time, Ed was heading up an English language program in Tehran for NIRT. The, uh, in, in English, it was a national Iranian radio intelligence. So for employees of NIRT, uh, it was a program uh, in affiliation with USC. Ed was a director of the program. He was on break and he was back in Los Angeles. He came over to the house and he said, Paul, why don't you come to Iran and teach English for a while? You'll make as little progress on your dissertation there as you're making here, but you'll have a wonderful time in a new country and you'll be exposed to a new culture and make new friends and um, possibly learn part of a new language. Two weeks later, I arrived in Tehran. And a month after that, John had uh, sublet our house, shipped our two dogs <laughs> to two wonderful miniature schnauzers to Tehran, and the four of us had an incredible year in Iran. So that was 1975 to 1976. And when we got back, Ed was once again instrumental in giving me the push and the encouragement I needed to actually finish my dissertation. I changed it to a topic in Persian grammar, which finally worked out for me. And so I got my degree in 1981. Uh, Several years after that, Ed honored me by asking me to be principal co-author on Looking at Languages, which is the workbook for an introductory linguistics class that accompanied his linguistics textbook, which was called Language, Its Structure and Use. Um, so that was a big deal for me because I had, didn't have any publications beyond my, dis my dissertation. Uh, the book did well. It's as you can see, it went into six editions, which we were both very proud of. And then we jumped to 2005. In 2005, I was teaching at USC 
but not in the linguistics department. I was in the business school. I was in the Marshall School of Business in what is now the Department of Business Communication. And I was chair of the department at the time. During the summer, James Cameron's production company, which is called Lightstorm Entertainment, sent emails to various linguistics departments in the area looking for a linguist who could develop uh, a language for a science fiction film. At the time, we had no idea it was going to be called Avatar. The code name was Project 880. Now, that email, that broadcast email, went to the USC linguistics department. Remember, I was in a totally different place. I would never have seen it if Ed had not forwarded the email to me saying, Paul, I think you would be interested in this. Well, I took a look at it and I said, yeah, I'm really interested in this. And so I essentially applied for the job. Um, I wrote to James Cameron. I sent him a copy of our workbook. And uh, a week or so later, I got a call from his people. Why don't you come in and talk to Jim? So I had an incredible afternoon, 90 minutes in the private office of this gentleman here, who probably needs no introduction. And um, James Cameron and I discussed his vision for the film, his vision for the language. The discussion went pretty well. And um, at the end, as I mentioned in the little video you saw, um, we stood up, shook hands, and he said, welcome aboard. And so that was really the genesis of my involvement in Navi, which has continued very happily to the present day. So um, let me tell you a little bit about what went into the initial phases of constructing the language. Um, there were certain criteria that I had to meet. I wasn't totally free to do absolutely everything or anything that I might have wanted with the language. Uh, some of the constraints were externally imposed by the conditions that I was working in and by James Cameron himself. And some were things that I imposed upon myself. Excuse me. So the externally imposed constraints. First of all, there's no question it had to be an entirely new language. Um, by the way, some people in the early days when hearing that someone like me was hired to do a new language said things like, um, there are so many dying languages that were languages on the brink of extinction, extinction. Wouldn't it make more sense to revive one of those and use it for the purposes of the film? Well, the answer to that is that would not work because every language is tied to its environment, tied to its culture, tied to the people who speak it. Uh, but we'll, we'll get into more of that later. So it has to be an entirely new language. He wanted it to sound nice. Now, what sounds nice and what doesn't sound nice is a very subjective thing, obviously. Uh, it has to be in the ear of the beholder. Um, but I did my best. There'd be no electronic manipulation of the voices. In other words, uh, the actors had to be able to pronounce it. And that also implied that the vocal mechanism of the Navi would be very similar to ours, since the voices would be similar and the range of sounds they could produce would be similar as well. Uh, I wasn't starting from absolute ground zero because um, Jim had come up with maybe about 30 words of his own. Most of them were names of characters, sometimes names of animals and so on. So I looked at those and I got a bit of a sense of the kind of sound he had in his ear. And I uh, had to reject a few of those words because they didn't fit with the sound system that I eventually came up with, but most of them I was able to retain. Uh, and finally, uh, well, almost finally, the language had to be learnable by human beings because part of the plot of Avatar is that there are humans, what we're called sky people, who have learned to speak the language. Needless to say, that uh, that relates to things that Professor Chomsky was saying uh, a little while ago. What sort of languages would be learnable? What sort of languages would not be learnable? But that obviously imposes a certain constraint on the nature of the structure of the language. And finally, it had to be feasible for the actors because these people had to be able to 
to it, at least pronounce it convincingly uh, without, without too much agony. Now, in terms of the constraints I imposed upon myself, I wanted to make it stand up to scrutiny because I knew very well that in this day and age, there'll be a small cohort of people which will pounce on anything that's offered in this context. And, um, and if there's anything that needs to be criticized, they will criticize it very vocally. So I really wanted to make sure that it would stand up to linguistic scrutiny. I wanted to make it interesting. I had a sense that maybe some people might be interested in trying to pick it up. So I wanted to include some things in it which would um, fire up some people's imagination. This was a language spoken on another planet, technically another moon, uh, many light years away. Well, actually, I think about four point something light years away. It's a long way. So it couldn't be terribly familiar. It had to be somewhat unusual, unique. And this was something I imposed upon myself. Um, I tried to walk a line between making the language so simple that it would lose interest for people. And on the other hand, making it so extraordinarily complex that anyone who wanted to begin to understand it would simply throw up their hands and say, forget it, I'm never going to learn this. So that was sort of a balancing act I tried to do. And actually, I'm pretty happy with, with the way that, that, that turned out. So the kinds of things that you think about when you're trying to construct a language from scratch is, as you might imagine, the various components that go into like phonetics and phonology, morphology, what do, you know, how do you build words in the language, what happens to the noun first, uh, syntax. And one of the most interesting things of all, how the language interacts with its culture and the environment and with the people who are speaking it. So uh, what I'd like to do is go through each of these elements um, in turn and see if we can we could get some of, this, some of the things about the language. Are we doing, are we, are we doing okay? Okay, um, uh, can I still be heard and everything? Yeah, you're okay? heard, you're perfect. Oh. Yeah, yeah, okay. you're okay. Yeah, yeah sure. Please, sure. Yeah. please go ahead. Okay. Yes, okay. So, okay, so this will be a whirlwind tour of Navi. And I, I'm going to go through it fairly fairly fast because because if I don't, I can get bogged down very easily and take another hour and a half just to talk about this stuff. So um, let's take a look at it. So as you saw in the little video, um, this is the sound system of Navi. These are the consonants. Um, and what's interesting is what's there and also what's not there. So if you take a look at it, you realize immediately that there are certain very familiar sounds which are not included in the language. There are no voice stops. So there's no b, there's no d, there's no g. Um, what there is is that top line which has um, attracted, I guess, the most attention. By the way, before we go on, just to make it <laughs> make something that uh, I'm sure is very obvious to you, just to, uh, just to make it clear, this is not IPA. So this is a spelling system that I, that I, inv that I devised for Navi, but I think it's fairly transparent. Uh, the top line are those interesting sounds, those ejectives, um, which Steve is very familiar with because they're found in uh, MR. So these are sort of popping sounds which I've indicated just orthographically with an X. The X has no value by itself. It's simply an orthographic way of indicating the adjective. So it's um, the top line has sounds like ah and o and e. So those are the consonants. These are the vowels. It's a somewhat asymmetric vowel system. There's a tense lax distinction in uh, among the uh, the high front vowels, but not among um, the back vowels. So um, the uh, the high front vowels are e and i and e. The a with the umlaut is a. Uh, the regular a is a and o and u. So it's a seven vowel system. There are also pseudo vowels u and r, very strongly trilled. R, these function kind of like vowels. And then there are four diphthongs. 
Uh, three of them are very familiar. The EW one is not familiar. It's kind of ew, ew. Okay, so um, then you have to think about what are the syllables going to look like? What are the constraints on where sounds can appear in a syllable? So only 12 of the 20 consonants can be syllable final. And these are the ones that are read. So you can, you can have a syllable that ends in a nasal or a syllable that ends in a, a liquid or ends in um, a stop, but you cannot have a syllable that ends in a <laughs> Uh, what about at the uh, front? Professor Frommer, I'm so yeah. sorry. Can I just interrupt you for a second sure. and humbly ask everyone except Professor Frommer and Professor Krashen to turn off their cameras and microphones so that we have no noise interference, please. Okay. Thank okay. you so much, Professor sure. Frommer. I'm so sorry for the, for the interruption. No problem. Okay, so um, what about... Um, the beginning of a syllable. For example, what about consonant clusters? So needless to say, English is very flamboyant in the kinds of consonant clusters, both at the beginning and the end of a syllable that it allows. My favorite example is strengths. If you think about it, it has three consonants before the vowel and four afterwards. N, k, th, and s. Now, most languages, I think it's fair to say, um, look at that with a bit of horror. Uh, now, Navi, oh, okay, okay. so um, brick is a perfectly good English word. Blick is not a word, but it could be because BL is a perfectly decent consonant cluster in the, at, at the beginning of the syllable, but brick can never be an English word. So there's constraints on what consonant clusters are allowed and what aren't. Well, the same thing is true in Navi. These are all the initial consonant clusters you can possibly have. So as you see, each one has to begin with one of those red consonants, and it can be followed by any of the blue consonants. And those are the only ones allowed. So you get some interesting consonant clusters. Uh, this, by the way, is, um, is just uh, a good way to symbolize it. So the red can be the first consonant in a two consonant cluster and the blue letters, the blue consonant rather, can be the second. And that's it. You can't have any more. So you get some interesting sounding words. Uh, metal is fga. I'm oh, sorry, let me do that again. Fga. Enter is fakim. Chance skom. Gift is skeli. Stone is ske. Weep is snauvik. However, you cannot have, say, PL at the beginning of a, of a word, as in play, or, or BR as in brown. Now, in addition to syllable structure, syllable constraints, there are these things called phonological rules, pronunciation rules. So let's take a look at some of these words. Um, uh, the words, I'll read them down list. Nari, kifke, pai, tirea, elan, and ora. Now, to say in these various things, use me, which is an ad position. So in the eye is minari. Okay, how do you say in the world? Mehifke, ah, something's going on. In the water is mefai. In the spirit, any guesses? Mesirea. Okay. In the heart, here the ejective has come just a regular, has become a regular stop. And in the lake is meora. So something's going on here. And it's a phonological rule, which has a name. It's called lenition. And so under certain circumstances, there's a weakening of these consonants um, triggered by various things. It could be triggered by some syntactic things, by prefixes, by ad positions, in this, in this case, prepositions and so on. If you want to speak the language, this process has to become absolutely second nature and you just get it by acquisition, I guess. Uh, so this uh, is a summary. It's only the red consonants that participate um, in this process. And this will give you a sense of what happens. So in each case, you're lowering one line. So when these 
consonants become subject to lenition, the ejectors become regular stops, the stops become fricatives, and uh, the glottal stop is simply lost. So that's kind of the major phonological rule in the language. Okay, so moving on from phonology, let's talk about morphology. So what do the verbs look like? What do the nouns look like? Okay, so uh, the root for hunt is taron. Here are some possible inflections of that word. You see, what's going on here? Well, as you notice, you don't see any prefixes and you don't see any suffixes. All of the inflectional morphology on verbs is done by infixes. Now, there are plenty of languages that use infixes um, on earth, but I've never seen a language that uses it with, um, shall we say, such enthusiasm <laughs> as Nami does. All of the inflection morphology is done through infixes. So this will show you where the root is and what has been inserted. So the root is taron, but you see at various places, you've got these infixes, which mean various things. So the first one, tolaron, is, a, is the perfective, means hunting has been completed or hunted. Tayaron means will hunt. Tiavaron means uh, may be about to hunt. Tirmareon means was just hunting and I'm happy about it because the E-I is an attitudinal showing that the speaker is pleased by what he or she is saying, uh, and so on. So all of these infixes have various semantic functions. And um, there are, as you see, certain infixes which are first position and certain which are, which are second position. Um, early on, some of the Navi fans tried to have a form that had the maximal number of possible infixes. And they came up with this word. Tepekia verkeo. And what, it, what the sentence means is, I'm so jazzed that he may be about to drink himself to death. <laughs> and the way, the way that works is the central word there, which is a verb, the root is terko, which means to die. And you have various infixes, which mean various things. So there's a... Uh, the the a p by the way when i do this does it appear on your screen the little thing that are that little circle i'm doing yep oh. you can't see that or not yes 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 oh. it does professor former yes yes we yes. can see that excellent. excellent okay so so this ap tap is a reflexive um eight is causative this is sort of a future subjunctive and this is an attitudinal saying that you're happy and that actually gives you the meaning of that sentence. So that, 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 was, that was kind of fun. Okay, so what do the nouns and pronouns, what do the substances look like? Well, uh, Eitukan, as those of you know who saw the film, is the name of the clan leader. And uh, here's his name in the various forms, in all the cases that it could uh, be inflected. Okay, so so this is a complete noun paradigm for etukan, and we're going to look at that in a little bit more detail. Um, before we do, what's the good of this kind of stuff? Well, here's the English sentence: etukan sees neitiri. Uh, obviously, etukan is the subject; sees is a verb; neitiri is the object. So this is s. V O. And so you ask yourself, in how many ways can these three elements be permuted? Mathematically, of course, it's six. So I've given you all the possible permutations in English of etukan sees neitiri, and let's see what, what happens with them. Well, first one is fine. Etukan neitiri sees is not English. Neitiri sees etukan is English, but it means something totally different. And then the other three, neitiri etukan sees, sees etukan neitiri, sees neitiri etukan. That's not normal English. And so, not that you had to be, <laughs> had to be uh, alerted to this fact, but English is very strict when it comes to word order. Only, uh, only certain word orders will work. Um, I wanted to play around with Navi and see how flexible the word order could possibly be. And so the case system helped a lot. So here's the same sentence in Navi, 
A to can C is my theory. Um, A to canal is the number one. A to canal C A my theory. And the ending, the suffix on A to can indicates that he is the agent doing the seeing, and the T at the end of my theory indicates that she is the object. And what I've done here is I've done the same thing. I've arranged that sentence into all possible permutations, and they, they're all fine. So um, since you're all language people, I think this would be kind of interesting because this is getting in, into it a little bit deeper. So um, if we take a look at, at, at some very simple sentences like John is sleeping, Mary ate the ice cream. OK, um, this is obviously an intransitive structure. John is the subject of an intransitive verb. There's no object. But here, Mary is a subject. <laughs> And she is doing, whoop, sorry, she is doing something to the ice cream. So uh, this terminology, SAP, um, I think it originates with um, my dissertation advisor, a uh, very famous and wonderful linguist um, typologist named uh, Renard Comrie. S stands for subject, A stands for agent, and P stands for P patient or the object. Now, the question is, how can a language mark these three nouns or these three noun phrases in different ways? Well, th this is an exhaustive list of the possibilities. Number one, subject of an intransitive verb, agent and patient are simply marked the same way or not marked at all. Or it's a language like that, English. Okay, unless, it, unless you're talking about pronouns, we don't do anything to mark subjects, agents, agents, and patients. Okay, uh, line number two says, subjects and agents are marked in one way and patients are marked in a different way. Are there languages like that? Absolutely. Okay, you would call that what? Um, nominative accusative language, right? And Latin is a language like that, ancient Greek, Russian, and so on. Okay, number three is uh, perfectly viable, less familiar perhaps to, um, to speakers of European yeah. languages, this is uh, a, ca um, a case marking system where the agent is singled out for special treatment and then subject and patient are marked in the same way. Um, so this is an ergative absolutive language. Uh, a language like that would be Basque, for example. Number four, where agent and patient are marked the same and subject is marked differently. I don't know of any languages like this. I don't think number four exists. Number five is when each of those three are marked differently. So you have three different kinds of markings. So this one is possible, but very rare among human languages. And if, so, of course, that's the one that I chose for Navi. So in Navi, subject of an intransitive verb, agent of a transitive verb, and patient are marked in three different ways. And so that's what you have here. So this is the subject case. This is the agent case, patient. There's a genitive case. There's a dative. And then there's a topic. Some people might not call that a case, but it's very useful in Navi. Okay. So much for morphology. What about syntax? So as I mentioned, I tried to keep the word order as flexible as possible, and I gave people a lot of alternatives. So for example, genitives, possession can come either before or after the noun. Simple means father. Nea is your. So you can say either Nea yeah, simple or simple gain. They're both fine and they both mean your father. Uh, adjectives are the same way. Uh, Leu means word. Meep, M-I-P, means new. And you can put it either before or after the noun. But notice there's a connector which comes between the adjective and the noun in each case. And uh, those of you in Iran may... Uh, May, may, think, may feel this is very familiar. I think this is kind of inspired by the Ezafe construction in uh, Persian. Uh, and relative clauses are the same way. They can come either before or after the noun. We don't have prepositions or, po or, or uh, postpositions in that. We have add position because deri, which means about, can either become, it can either come before the noun, about Navi, in which case it's a separate word, or it can come after the noun and be attached to it. 
So those are some of the uh, syntactic idiosyncrasies, if you like. Of now, now, how do you construct words? A lot of people think, well, a language, you know, if, if you're going to make a language, you simply uh, start translating some words and then you're done. Well, it's not as easy as, easy as that. So I'm going to uh, talk very briefly about the, the, the four different kinds of, uh, of paths you can take, methodologies for constructing the lexicon of a language. So the first one is very rare, and that's simply borrowing. Now, so there are borrowed words in English, mainly which come, uh, and Navi rather, which come from English. Uh, poop. Why is this an appropriate word for borrowing? Because the Navi did not have books prior to the arrival of humans. They do not have a written language. And so the concept of book was not known. So if they're going to talk about book, things they've seen in the possession of, uh, of humans, they would need a word for it. And chances are they would simply borrow the word for book and filter it through the Navi phonological system and come up with book. Uh, another word like that is quinship for gunship, rata for earth. Now, um, a more common way of coming up with new lexical items is through derivational processes. So we've seen the word, the verb taron for hunt. Titaron is a derived noun, meaning hunting as an abstract concept. Setaron is a particular hunt, you know, as in we had a great hunt today. And uh, taronyu is an agent of meaning hunter. So you get those four new lexical items from the original hunt through uh, standard derivation of processes in the language. Um, you also have combining existing items. So um, I needed a word for interesting to be interesting. Um, L2 is brain. And uh, NC means to awaken, to awaken the brain. When you awaken the brain, you're interesting. Okay. Uh, how do you say computer? Uh, computer is L2 left na, which is a metal brain. Um, sorry. This is a word for actually, and um, it's, I, I kind of like this. It's composed from various elements that already existed in the language. Uh, ne is an adverbial uh, element, somewhat uh, akin to English ly. Tifketo means situation, and angai means true. So the word comes from ne, tifketo, angai, and I try to think, how in putting those elements it would evolve over time, what elements might might drop out, what might be sort of glommed together, and it came out to nifketo ngai. So it's kind of um, true situationally, which is actual. Now, of course, the most obvious way of constructing new lexical items is to just come up with totally new roots. And for this, there is no methodology, you just, Kind of do it, play around, see what sounds good, what 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 kind of what kind of feels right, uh, and is really kind of a, a, a gut feeling, kind of a hunch. So, Lord is beautiful, Eving child, who cloud. I tried to do a little bit of kind of um, uh, what shall I say, iconic thinking. So, okay, yeah, Vrteb is demon. So, Tue and Nazik. Do it sounds kind of easy to me, and nazik sounds a little bit difficult. Okay, this of course is all extremely subjective. Um, smooth and rough. Smooth is fawi. You have three vowels in sequence there. Rough is ektu. Okay, now obviously language doesn't necessarily do that or even do it um, very regularly, but every so often it's kind of fun. Okay, um, now this part is for me some of the most interesting stuff at all. The Navi language had to fit into the environment of Pandora and be appropriate to the Navi who speak it. And so that meant it had to have certain special elements um, which would not be found in Earth languages. So one thing that occurred to me, 
How do you count in Navi? Uh, it turns out that the Navi are different from humans in that they have four digits on each hand rather than five. And so it occurred to me they probably would not have a decimal system, but rather an octal system, base eight. And I approached James Cameron with that, and he said, oh, absolutely. So here's how you count in Navi. Al, mune, e, sing, mr, puka, kine, vol. Vol is eight. And what is nine? Volau, eight and one. Ten is vomun, eight and two, eight and three, and so on. Uh, what else? Well, there, there are various registers in the language, um, just as there is in English and in probably most other languages, there is sort of um, a formal, honorific, kind of ceremonial uh, register of the language. What would be an analogy in English? Not too much, but during the marriage ceremony, there are still people who, uh, who will say things like, um, with this ring, I thee wed. Okay, now that is absolutely not modern English. It's an archaic form, but it's, it's appropriate uh, for use in a ceremonial context. And so we have that in Navi as well. Uh, pronouns have different forms if you're being very deferential or involved in some kind of ceremony. So regular I is oe, but uh, in ceremonial register it's ohe. Nga becomes nga nga. Uh, the verb lu becomes lu yu. By the way, y u there is not a suffix. The infix is u y, and the original verb is the L at the beginning and the U at the end. Now, uh, this is for me the most fun of all. Uh, every language has its own proverbs, its own idiomatic expressions. And so we certainly have that in Napi as well. So uh, one that, was, that we came up with early on, I don't remember who came up with this. I don't think it was me. Um, and you heard this in the uh, little video that you saw. Uh, ahead of time. The tail and ears also speak. Okay, in the Navi, the um, the tail and ears are very expressive. And so this is telling you, don't just listen to the words, look at the body language. Um, if you saw the film, you remember these very interesting plants. Uh, in Navi, they're called Loreu in English. The name James Cameron came up with was Helicoradi. And what makes them interesting is if, if you touch them, they immediately sort of shrivel up and, uh, and recede into the ground. They're very, very sensitive. And so we have the expression, naloreo uh, nampi, which means like a touch Helicoradian. Uh, and you can imagine what this refers to. It refers to someone who is extremely shy and, and reserved. Um, now, this is kind of fun. Proverbs very often don't depend exclusively on meaning, but there's some word play involved. So we can look at a couple of English examples. Okay, all that glitters is not gold. Okay. Why isn't it all that shines is not gold? Why not all that glitters is not silver? Well, because this sounds good in English, because you have the, 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 the alliteration between the g and the g. Uh, a stitch in time saves nine. Why not a stitch in time saves 13? Or a stitch in, in time saves six? Well, obviously, this works and is memorable because time and nine sound somewhat similar. Okay, so uh, this exists in other languages as well. Uh, when I was studying, studying Persian, I really... Loved it when I came across this expression here, which means all that's round is not a walnut. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. I, I hope I have that right. Uh, so, gerdi is roundness and gerdu is walnut. Why not? All that's round is not an apple. All that's round is not a ball because of this wonderful wordplay between gerdi and gerdu. Um, this is one I like from Yiddish. Uh, uh, and it means when you need brains, brawn doesn't help. So you have these two words here, which means brains, 
intelligence, and koyach means strength. Uh, so here we have a uh, we have a very brawny boxer who is trying to figure out what's going on in a calculus textbook. So does this exist in Navi? Absolutely. Uh, so here's a proverb: "Kemamuye kumafe." Good action, bad result. Okay, you can use this when you had all the best intentions, you did the right things, but it still came out badly. So kem means action, kum means result. And the uh, the wordplay between kem and kum I thought was kind of nice. Fweke um, kefwefwi. I came up with this. I really had a lot of fun with it because we had these words. And fweke means a mantis and fwefwi means whistle. And I love the way this sounds. Fweke kefwefwi. A mantis doesn't whistle. And we use that to mean uh, don't expect someone to do something that's not in their nature. And this, uh, this we came, we we uh, we originated about three days ago. Ayalalip, sketirip, dripping water pierces your rock. So, leap is drip, and rip is pierce. So, um, those are just some ways that we kind of play around with things to, to try to make the language as appropriate to the culture and the environment as possible. Uh, this is one of my favorite words, meoni uh, aea, and it refers to something that's very important in Navi culture and philosophy, which is the balance of life, respecting the interplay, respecting the ecology, uh, and so on. Okay, uh, working with the actors. So this is what the set of the first film looked like. I mean, it was my great pleasure and privilege to be invited to the set to work with the actors. As you see, it does not look like anything that you might expect of a standard movie set to look like. The technology is really the thing that, that, that makes it all work. Uh, I got to meet people that I never thought I'd meet before in my life. Here's uh, Sigourney Weaver, an absolutely Lovely woman, speaking to James Cameron. Um, I thought you'd find this interesting. So this is how I work with the actors, and this is what I actually presented to them in written form. So, um, and by the way, I should say that this is in addition to MP3 recordings, which were the most important thing by far. But let me go back. So, what you can what you can see, I um, I did here. So here's the English. Here's the Navi, and the underlining tells the actor which syllable is stressed because stress is unpredictable and not, you simply have to know where it is. And then I gave a word for word gloss so that they would know um, which words meant what. I should say here that nobody, uh, no one in the cast, none of the actors learned the language to the point where they understood the grammar and were able to come up with sentences of their own. And they were not expected to do that. They did not sign on for that. Their job was to learn to pronounce the language and make it sound as convincing as possible, make it sound like their own language. And they all were extremely uh, eager to do that, work extremely hard to do that. Uh, the, the other thing that, I, that, that was useful and that a lot of people wanted was sort of an Englishy quasi phonetic transcription. So if you're used to English, then this can sometimes help. But I did want people to rely on this too much because it can obviously lead, lead people astray. Okay, so um, this is what I saw with my own eyes. And here's Sam Worthington, who played Jake. And you can see he's wearing what's called a performance capture suit. It's full of all these, uh, these sensors, which are picked up by I don't know how many cameras at the same time. And through the magic of the technology, which Jim Cameron invented, that was turned into things like this. So I thought that the, the movie was absolutely a visual feast and it was really quite extraordinary. Okay, so the movie came out uh, at the end of 2009 and that was not at all the end of my involvement with not me because things continued after that. So there were new ventures, uh, which were not new movies, but new projects which were based on the movie. So one of them was a wonderful Cirque du Soleil production called Toto, 
which ran quite a while. It was really spectacular. It played in various cities all over the world and played in Europe, played in Canada, played in a lot of places in the U.S. And um, the Navi community organized uh, field trips to be in the city where they were going to do the show. Uh, here's a graphic from, as you can see, it's absolutely extraordinarily wonderful. And there was a lot of Navi used in the show. There was a narrator who uh, was narrating to the audience, whatever the audience's language was, whether it's English or French or German or whatever. But the performers had to learn to speak Navi, which was really a lot of fun for me. Um, it's another shot from that show. Uh, and now there is now quite an extraordinary theme park in Orlando, Florida, uh, associated with Disney World, called Pandora, the World of Avatar. Uh, and this actually recreates the environment of Pandora, of where Avatar takes place. It's really um, a very, very interesting experience. And they use a the language as well, which was it has been a lot of fun for me. Um, just a few, this is some uh, promotional material. The, uh, the ride that they have, this 3D virtual reality ride is utterly spectacular. And if you ever have a chance to be in Orlando, Florida uh, and, and take the ride, I would highly recommend it. This is a brochure that is handed out to visitors as they enter the park. One of the brochures, it tells them about the various flora and fauna that they'll see. And I'm going to enlarge the lower left-hand corner. And what you have here is the, the safety rules, what you have to do. And as you notice, they're bilingual in English and Navi, which was a lot of fun. So I really had a, a, a lot of fun doing that. But perhaps the most satisfying thing of all for me is uh, my connection to the Lit Fiaolo, the Navi community. Um, there's a group of fans, as I mentioned, um, who have taken to the language and embraced it and made it their own. And it's been an absolute uh, delight and a privilege to work with them. The movie, as I mentioned, came out in December. I forget what date it was, December of 2009. Several days before the movie came out, I received this email. <laughs> and it absolutely floored me. Because the movie isn't even out yet, and someone is writing to me in Not Me. Well, it turned out that a group of extraordinarily devoted fans got together and they used the material that had already been out there. Um, uh, a glossary had leaked and had been published in, in a book, and I had done a few interviews and talked to some linguists for a, a, a language blog. Anyway, they put it together and deconstructed the language as best they could. And this fellow, Britain, who has since become a very close friend, extraordinarily talented uh, language learner and, and, and linguist, uh, wrote to me in not me. So um, I became involved with the community. There were some wonderful meetings that, that went on for years. Um, this actually was very interesting. There's a, a genuine academic uh, uh, linguistic anthropologist whose name is Dr. Christine Schreier. She's in Canada at the University of British Columbia. And she did a study of the Navi community here on earth, people who uh, were involved in the language to see who were they, where were they, why were they interested in the language and so on, and came up with some very interesting things. Uh, just a few things. This was a very first meeting in 2010. Some of these people are still involved in, in the language. I think about five of them. Um, this is Britain, who is one of the absolutely wondrous speakers of the language. Uh, there was a lot of horseplay going on. I did a little language class. Uh, this is a few years later. This is in 2013 uh, at one of the Avatar meetups, a European Avatar meetup um, in Germany. This is obviously Berlin. Um, if you're familiar with the term cosplay, it's become a big thing, and people will dress up as your favorite characters in various movies. Um, it's really quite extraordinary, the, uh, the effort that people go to to look like Navi. And um, 
they must have attracted quite a bit of attention in Berlin as they all met me at the uh, at the main train station uh, and kind of walked through the streets of Berlin that way. Uh, at some of these avatar meetups, both in the uh, in North America and in Europe, I gave some classes. Uh, introductory classes. Here's one of the students in the class, as you see. Um, the classes were about the best I could do, given the fact that it will be one class for about an hour per year. The question is, how much you can do with that? Well, I wanted to leave them with something. This is, um, this is one of the handouts that I gave out. As you see, it's very traditional. Uh, I tried to come up with some very simple dialogues. Uh, a little bit of simple vocabulary, a few little simple practices. Uh, again, uh, pattern practice, very, very simple stuff. Um, this is a very, very creative community. Just to show you some of the things that people have done. Uh, this is a movie review of the movie Inception in Navi. Uh, people come up with wonderful graphics. Uh, someone came up with this, um, with this enthusiastic, supportive slogan, Evol Navi, which means let Navi bloom. Uh, this is an early uh, a screenshot of an early um, blog post that I put up with, that, that I came up with. Um, this, by the way, is something that my husband John did. Uh, he actually designed a lapel pin. I think it's very beautiful. It has that slogan, Evol Navi, uh, on the perimeter. And this is a graphic inspired by the film. Uh, this, by the way, um, my blog continues. I've been posting to it more these days. This is uh, this is the way it typically looks. So this is where I introduce new vocabulary, where people can learn some of the, the fine points of grammar. It's mainly aimed at intermediate to advanced learners. And so as you see, I'll, uh, I'll give new vocabulary. I'll say a few things. I'll give examples of how the vocabulary is used and so on. Uh, some of the things that happen on the blog, uh, we run contests. In, in fact, there's a contest being run now. So um, this was a winner in a haiku contest a while back. This is Britain again, and I love the haiku he came up with. Uh, this particular form of haiku has, seven, has five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables. And what I love about this is that the seven-syllable line is, in fact, the shortest. Sreo ma frapo sreo. Which means dance, everyone dance, a ceremonial drum, come, let's celebrate. I think it's really beautiful, beautiful and evocative. Um, we have people writing poetry. We have people writing stories. Uh, I'm happy to share uh, the most creative work on my blog. Now, uh, we've had some listening exercises recently, and I invited uh, several of the more proficient people to uh, record their own stories and I would publish it on the blog. So um, this is the beginning of a little story by I Stefan. Whoa, whoa. No, 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 stop, 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 stop. Sorry, that was a little preliminary. <laughs> Go back to that in a second. So um, Stefan Miller is one of the absolute experts in the Nazi language. He lives um, in, in, in Germany. And he submitted a wonderful story um, about, about two characters. This is Istal and this is Suku. A Suku is a prolemerous, which is a six limbed, somewhat ape like creature. And it's a story about an unusual, unusual friendship between these two. Um, I want to I hope I can get back to the beginning of this. I want to play this for you, uh, just the very beginning of. Uh, of the story, which Stefan recorded. Um, you won't understand it, but uh, just listen to how beautifully he speaks the language. I really love the way he, way he speaks. Ein Arul figurit ate elanteri staue si siukue. Neue pivenga ein arteri ze ate elan, ze pelun, tanuna fit elan dupuma mekam tu tan si siaksiu. Sre kr, kerulen fitif keto kau kr. Fit the elaneri pefialen septimicium. Tono, gratutana erwana lo istau terminari au parot an luc ee, sextolaum pol haumpantias ton amenari. 
Isn't that beautiful? I I I, I just love the way the way the way he's, he 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 speaks not me. Um, now we also have some, uh, I think rather impressive resources. So this is the dictionary that has been around for a, a very long time and it keeps getting updated. Uh, it's been updated by um, by Mark Miller, who is um, one of the stalwarts of the Navi community. Okay, so here's a typical page, and um, this is the beginning of the L's. And you see a lot goes into this. So, for example, you have the Navi spelling, you have the transcription in IPA, uh, part of speech, meaning, and sometimes where the word derives from. So this is extremely useful. However, there's another dictionary, which is, I think, just an absolutely extraordinary uh, work of love, really. It's the annotated Navi dictionary. And this is compiled by Stefan Müller. And what makes this such an important adjunct to the other dictionary, here's a typical page. You see, it's a lot different. What Stefan did and what he continues to do is to, for every lexical item, go through all the canonical material, the stuff that I've had in my blog, the stuff that I've said in various contexts, and give examples of the usage of the word. So, for example, for, uh, let's see, for la, which is physical separation, you have the stuff in the other dictionary, the IPA and so on, but then you have an example of how it's used. And this is really quite extraordinary. For lahe, uh, the, one, the first example is, um, uh, which means other or else, first example is, why isn't this night the same as all other nights? The same like all others. Um, perhaps to some of you that will, um, that will have resonance. Okay, so um, to conclude, I've been thinking about what are the challenges of teaching a constructed language as opposed to teaching a language like uh, English or, or Persian. Uh, obviously, there's some major differences. One is that there are no native speakers. The other is that chances are the resources and written materials are going to be far, far less. Um, most of the people are going to be involved in self-study. So. Um, this is something that I'd like to open up to discussion. Uh, I realize it's getting late, so I don't want to take too much more time. But I'd be very interested in hearing people's ideas because uh, many of you folks know much more about language acquisition and modern theories of language pedagogy than I do. So I hope we can have maybe a, at least a little discussion about that. Before I conclude, I just want to mention this one thing. Yeah, let's discuss. Um, if you're interested in constructed languages in general, it turns out it's a very, very interesting story. And people have been doing it literally for, th for, th for thousands of years. Uh, and it's not just the people like myself and like Mark Okrand, who created Klingon, and like David Peterson, who created the languages for Game of Thrones and so on. It's not just people like us, but there's a far larger group of people who do it just for the love of it, with tremendous dedication. So there is now a documentary film, full-length documentary film called Conlanging, The Art of Crafting Tongues. Full disclosure, I have a role in the film. But if you're interested in uh, the general idea of constructive languages, why people might be involved in this at all, I think you'll find the film interesting. Okay. Anyway, thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure to talk to people. And uh, let's talk. Oh, thank you so much, Professor Fromer. It was really great. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. And let me stop sharing. Now, let me see how to, just one second. Um, stop this. Okay, did that do anything? Yeah, yeah. That? That, that worked. Okay. Thank you. Good. Yes, wonderful. Okay. Oh, wonderful. So thank you. Thank you so much. And let me once again also acknowledge uh, the presence of Professor Kashin with us today. And also uh, Dr. Mason from Japan, 
Dr. Hassan Zadeh from Tehran and John Dahl from uh, Australia, but currently he's in Kuwait and he's with us today. So first okay. from uh, these people, I just acknowledge, do we have any comments, questions, Professor Krashen? Would you like to add anything? Yes, I don't know if you can hear me though. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure we can, yes. Oh, I can. hear. Well, I've just been looking at Christine Schreier's paper. Yes called a digital fandom of Navi speakers. And naturally I went to the part immediately where she asked, uh, I guess some of them do pretty well with it, uh, how they did it. And I'm very impressed at how much, how much progress they've made doing it fundamentally the hard way because there was no other way to do it. Yeah. Uh, amazing what motivation can give you. They created comprehensible input. Apparently, I would like to see some interviews. I think all I really want to say is this is a rich area for what works in language teaching, looking at some of these people under really difficult circumstances because there's very there's no there's no pedagogical texts. There are no easy texts, easy dialogues, which is the foundation of all language teaching. And nevertheless, they have managed to make some progress. This is quite a very interesting area. Very good. Yeah, um, it, it, is, it is quite extraordinary. Um, I should say that um, the majority of people are much more involved in writing and reading than in speaking. But there are people who are extremely dedicated. Um, and I should, uh, and, and I, I don't say this out of false modesty. There are a lot of people who speak it much more fluently than I do. <laughs> and, and perhaps... Uh, a good part of the reason is that they use it for speaking more than I do. I, I tend not to do that. Um, I tend to be a little bit careful in how I present myself because, for better or worse, everything that comes out of my mouth becomes, for want of a better term, sort of sacred text. You know, you know what I mean. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I am, I am very, very self-conscious. Be careful, yeah. <laughs> making mistakes and, 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 you know, either orally or written. I should tell you that I am very human and believe me, I will make mistakes. And when I do, uh, people invariably catch it and invariably correct me. They're extremely polite and extremely deferential, uh, but they will say things like, um, Paul, you, you, you said this yesterday, but back in, 2011, if you remember, we were at this meeting and you said it just the other way. So which one is it? And of course, I've totally forgotten what happened in 2011. And so I will have to say things like, well, um, the language has evolved since then. Or, uh, yes, but that was a different context. Or more honestly, you know, I goofed. And you're right, it should be the other way around. Uh, but but um, getting back to your observation, Steve, there are people who just want to master it to the point where it's a little bit, a little bit agonizing at first, but they, uh, they have meetings where English or whatever the, the L1 is, is prohibited and they, and they, they have to get around and not be so, uh, there's, um, there's some sort of online channel where there's a podcast and they try to speak not me exclusively. Uh, and so it, it, it's, 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 it's an interesting phenomenon. This is a case of a language acquiring speakers. It, yeah, <laughs> good point. Yeah. This is great. So let's Professor, see if we have any, com yes, who's talking, oh, John is talking. Uh, John, this is go John. Ahead, please. Professor, John, thank, yeah. you. thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I've been working as a, as an English, as a second language um, and a foreign language. And I myself learned English as um, as a uh, third language. Uh, oh. Now, as as language learners, we have a reason. There are some generally very obvious and some not very obvious reasons for that. And thinking about Navi, what are the common reasons? Yeah. Um, you explained one of them, obviously. Um, in your study, what are the most common reasons to why people want to learn that or what yeah. makes them keen learners in other right. words 
Well, of course, that's 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 the question, isn't it? You know, why in the world would anyone want to devote so much time and energy and effort to learn a created language from a movie? Well, that's one of the things that uh, that Christine Schroyer asked, and she got uh, a pretty wide range of responses. Um, there's a large cohort who was so totally captivated by the movie that they don't, if they could, they would live in that environment. And since you can't go to Pandora, the one thing you can do is to speak the language. And so for those people, the motivation comes from the connection to the movie. Um, the very first meeting we had, which was in 2010, was sort of a teach the teachers meeting. Uh, there was a, um, a young guy from France and some of our, several of us were, were standing around talking. And um, the question was, how many times have you seen Avatar in a theater? So someone said, I saw it six times. And someone said, well, I saw it 11 times. The fellow from, from France reached into his, his pocket and pulled out a thick, uh, a, 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 a thick group of ticket stubs. He had seen it 36 times. So, wow. I mean, this is dedication, and people people just wanted to maintain the connection. Okay. Um, there's another group of people who are into languages, and they just find this fascinating. And it's something new. and something that no one else does. And they can get in on the ground floor, and they can be the experts. Because if they're going to study French or Spanish or Persian or Chinese or Japanese, you know, there are millions and millions of experts in that language, but they can actually be among the world experts in the language. Uh, and it's, an, in, it, it's also an intellectual challenge. And maybe the third big cohort of people are people who find a community of like-minded people. Um, some of these people perhaps have not found that kind of uh, community attachment before, but it turns out, and I'm, 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 I'm delighted to recognize this. The Navi community is a very, very supportive, non-judgmental, very open community. Uh, and if you become part of it, you'll get an awful lot of support, an awful lot of validation, an awful lot of feedback, and you feel you can be part of something. So um, those, I think, are kind of the main reasons why, why people have gotten involved in the language. Thank you. Uh, sure. Professor Frommer, uh, regarding this one, uh, when I was thinking about the reasons why people would want to learn this language, apart from all the reasons you just mentioned, and actually uh, you are the owner of the language, so you know best, but I was also thinking that um, if a language does not belong to a community, then people will have a feeling of ownership at equal rates and, you know, so, for example, us as non-native speakers of English always think that English does not belong to us. But a conlang like uh, the one you have created, the Navi, can give us the feeling that we also have our own share of this language. Is that right? Yes. Yes, it is. Although I, uh, <laughs> I hope you feel that English belongs to you because I mean, for people at your level of proficiency, I mean, my gosh, it, it, it should feel like, like, like it's, your, it, it, it's your language as well. But you're right. Um, people do feel a sense of ownership. And actually, I should say something uh, connected with that. Uh, early on, people requested new vocabulary for me because people wanted to speak, wanted to write. And uh, I mean, the, the, the vocabulary, the original vocabulary that was sufficient for the needs of the movie, maybe 500 words, which is obviously not sufficient. And so I got a lot of requests for, you know, give us a word for this, please give us a word for this, and so on, which I would do. Mm. But at some point, I realized that a lot of these people had such a good feel, such a good grasp for the language, mm. what could be a word, what could not be a word, that not only could they request vocabulary, but they could actually suggest vocabulary. What do you think about this word? What do you think about that word? So I, um, I was very happy to entertain those uh, suggestions. And um, I could respond in one of three ways. I could say, wow, I love it. That's fantastic. It's in the language. Or I could say, uh, 
I like the direction you're going in. I think we can maybe make a few changes. Or I can say, I think we can do that differently. And since it's all submitted to me anonymously, there's no sense of, oh, I'm going to be hurt if you don't like my work. But um, that kind of ownership, I think, is perhaps unique in the conlanging, uh, at, at least in the, 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 the conlangs for, for movie and, and, and TV. And I'm thinking how wonderful it'll be if uh, during one of the Avatar sequels, uh, and I should mention there are four sequels that are they're being planned. Two of them are being yeah. planned right now. So wouldn't it be wonderful if um, a fan of the language were sitting in the audience listening to the dialogue and listening to the Navi and saying, that's my word, that's the word I come up with. So, uh, so yeah, there, 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 definitely, there definitely is, is that sense of, of, of ownership, like it's, it's, it's ours, right? Wonderful, wonderful. On that, Professor Frommer, actually, as I wrote to you earlier, some yes. of my colleagues from the IZ Education Center might want to suggest, okay. humbly suggest some words, okay. and then later you will see if you need to tweak or refuse them altogether. So we will hear from them. So for now, Dr. Mason, Dr. Hassan Zadeh, do you have any comments, questions? or my esteemed colleagues from IZ Education Center, any questions? Or other guests from other countries? We have a guest from Turkey, from Brazil, from China, I suppose. Yes, go ahead, please. Who's talking? Uh, excuse me? I'll go. Can I go? Nushant, go ahead, please. Hi, Nushant. Sure. It wasn't me. Hi. It was amazing. First of all, I was just... I was I couldn't even talk so thank you so much again I was actually wondering which part did you find the most challenging in constructing the Navi language or, or the whole experience what was the most challenging part yeah one very challenging thing I think it's sort of an occupational hazard is not to be too influenced by English or by the languages that I know Mm. because it's all too easy to come up with something and say, yeah, that, th that feels very good. And then to realize, wait a minute, that's kind of the way it's done in English or in French or in German or in Persian, you know, and uh, there are lots of other ways of doing it. So mm. trying, to, trying to make sure that I, that I didn't fall into that trap was, mm. a, uh, was a challenge. Um, Working with the actors was genuinely, uh, the, uh, generally a very pleasurable experience. But as I said, they really wanted to uh, to master it. There were times when I would be on the set, and it was a particularly emotional scene, for example, and there was an actor speaking the language, and I'm right there, you know, and I'm monitoring things. And there are several uh, other people there, including James Cameron. And of course, they do not just one take, but several takes. And so between, between takes, uh, I would sometimes see if I could sort of butt in and just talk to the actor and say, oh, that was really good, but you know, see if you can kind of change this a little bit. Well, there were times when I was told, all oh, quiet, OK? Oh, no. <laughs> Okay, we can talk about this later. I don't want you to break the mood. You just stand there and watch. Okay, so that, that, that at times was, but but I I totally understand. Then of course uh, the director was totally correct in in what he said. Great. Okay. Thank wonderful. You. Thank you, Dr. Mason, Dr. Hassan Zadeh. Any comments, questions, or uh, yeah. I suppose uh, yes. 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 Go ahead, please. Okay, so uh, hi from Tehran, Professor Frommer. Oh. Oh. <laughs> okay, um, I am an applied linguist and uh, well, I was pretty amazed by your speech and also, uh, yeah. Uh, well, uh, you know, the traditional uh, definition of a linguist is a person who speaks several languages. And uh, more, the more modern one, however, uh, someone who studies uh, languages scientifically. But I think in your case, you seem to have killed two birds with one stone. 
<laughs> well, and, uh, yeah, out of curiosity, I'm just asking this question because you said you you did a stint in Iran, uh, uh, and I just wanted to know how well do you know Farsi? Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> Because you seem to have an extraordinary flair for languages. Very well. You should please <laughs> speak Farsi. <laughs> what else is funny? My, 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 my Persian is not what it used to be. I mean, it, 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 it's a long time. And I don't have to tell you, um, in terms of uh, an active uh, mastery of, of language, it's kind of use it or lose it. And so I really have not, have not used my Persian very much. At one point, I thought I was, I was, you know, I was becoming fairly comfortable in certain situations. Um, I, I actually attended, I, 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 I was in Iran for 11 months and I went there knowing absolutely nothing about, no, I, I take that back. I, um, I recall that a couple of weeks before I was to leave for Iran, I managed to find an Iranian graduate student at USC and just had the person sit down with me and just teach me, you know, Khodafez uh, and Hoshmachi and, and, and things like that, just, you know, the bare minimum. But I really, I, I, I arrived in Iran knowing almost nothing at all about the language, but I did my very best. I took language, I took a language class and I tried to, you know, as best I could speak to some um, Iranians. I tried to find Iranians who didn't speak English, which is not easy given, given where we lived, but that was really good. I recall, uh, I don't know if you've ever had this experience in learning another language. Um, we would have dialogues in our Farsi class about various topics. And I remember one topic was about, um, traffic in Tehran and how bad it was at the time. Uh, and at the, after the class, I felt that I could really discuss traffic in Tehran pretty well. And, uh, for weeks after that, when I was, whenever I was talking to one of my Iranian friends, I would try to direct the, the, the conversation to talking about traffic because I had the vocabulary and I felt very comfortable talking about that. Um, but I mean, I, 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 very much love the language, and I even uh, have been exposed to a little bit of of, of uh, poetry. I mean, it's it's difficult for me. Um, I actually tried to learn a little bit of Hafez, but uh, as you know, it's it's that's not easy. I I, I also tried uh, tried to uh, to read some of um, Omar Khayyam. Wow, uh, those are even difficult for native speakers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great, wonderful. Wow. Awesome. <laughs> uh, but 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 I mean I I, I I can do a little bit of that. But um, it it's it, it it's it's fascinating stuff. It it I also find it fascinating to kind of look at the poetical forms and realize that poetry in the same in the time of Hafez was a different thing because the language was different and was based on on quantity rather than differences in quality. And so the meters are all based on quantity. And I really admire the um, the classical musicians who understand that and whose and whose music follows the original prosody of the poems. That that to me is absolutely fascinating. Yeah, definitely. Professor Farmer, on that, you were talking about the flexibility of word order in Navi. Farsi also has, you know, reasonable amount of flexibility in terms of word order, which makes it very suitable for, for poetry. Yes. Uh, Dr. Mason from Japan, any questions, any comments? Okay. Uh, Dr. Mason. Hello. Hi. Hi. 
Yes, um, I was wondering, you said you had 500 words to begin with. Yeah, now, yeah. how many words do you have in Navi? Okay, well, I would love to tell you that, that we have uh, many, many thousands of words. I think we're probably pushing around 3,000, which is okay. not a lot given the time. But um, in defense of that, I realize as I'm constructing vocabulary that there's a lot that goes into vocabulary construction, in, into construction of the lexicon, and it's much more so than you think. For example, you have to think about what is going to be the scope of a particular word. If I have a word like um, kind, a kind man, okay, can I extend that word to... Um, non-human things to things can can I can I can I say um a kind message well it doesn't necessarily follow you can do that maybe yes maybe no if I have a word for long in terms of length does it mean that that word is also going to apply to temporal situations can I use that same word to say a long time you can do it in English but you it's not clear that you can do it in other languages so it's those kinds of considerations that really take up a fair amount of time in, in, in constructing vocabulary. Wonderful. Thank you. I think Seema and uh, Dr. Atay, you also have questions. Seema and Mr. Uh, Mr. Atay, do you have questions? I think uh, since I'm not a linguist, maybe it's better uh, to turn to Seema. Okay. Seema, are you there? Yes. Okay. By the way, before Sima speaks, Professor Frommer, Sima is highly talented in acquiring languages. And the other day she was talking to me in Navi language, which was unbelievable. I mean, well, and, and she can try it now. I, do you want to have impressed. a go? Yes, let, let, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I, Sima, I, do you want to have a go? I'm very yeah. Alt E, Oru Siavko Sima. Uh, wow. I, I, Sima, I am very impressed. Ansan Walt, really excellent. Seso Nilsan, very, very well done. I'm, I'm, I'm very, very impressed. Good for you. Irayo, Irayo. Nipurte, my pleasure. Uh, so I have some questions um, and I wrote like four questions, but uh, I think that I must choose from them. Okay. So um, as um, you have suggested with the emergence of the new conglangs uh, like Dothraki, Navi and other uh, constructed languages, what future do you see and uh, what, uh, what do you think makes a uh, language creator successful? Wow. What makes a language creator successful? Um, Regarding the future of the create constructed languages and everything going on. And it's, 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 it's a good question and it's a difficult one and I'm not sure that I really have a very good handle on that. Um, I think partly if you want the language to kind of live on beyond the, the, the movie or the TV show or, or the book or whatever, uh, it has to attract a community. And part of it is that it is important to kind of strike this balance that I tried to talk about a little, little bit before, where the language is interesting enough so that it will keep people's attention but not so incredibly complex that it's going to totally turn them off. Um, probably the most successful language creator that I, kn that I know of is David Peterson, who, uh, among other things, was creator of the Game of Thrones languages, Dothraki, as you mentioned. Um, and um, David has a, a very, very loyal, large following. Uh, he created I don't know how many different and he has a real facility for doing it. Um, another, another consideration 
I guess, is in what context was the language originally spoken? And do people identify with the speakers of the language in that context, in that world? So with Navi, I was very fortunate because the Navi are nice and they're fun and they're nice people and you would like to be them. You would like to identify with them. Um, when it comes to Klingon, uh, there are a lot of people who identify with the Klingons and want to and want to speak their language. But that's that's a different kind of character, obviously. So um, if the character attracts a pretty good following, then chances are the language is going to come out as well. Uh, yeah, that doesn't yes. answer your question completely, but it, it's maybe a little bit of it. Oh, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Uh, Sima, I know you have lots of other questions, but later yeah. probably you can email okay. Professor Schrammer. Um, so, of thank because you I so know much. it's, I it's really 10 minutes... It. I know it's 10 minutes past 11, your time, Professor Frommer and Professor Krashen and Dr. Ashtari. Uh, I think if we have five more minutes, I will ask some of my uh, colleagues from IZ Education Center to... To, to, to give you their suggestions of words which you, right. you will consider in the future. Because when you said there are 3,000 words in Navi now, last night only, they suggested more than 10,000 words. And, you know, there was all this... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. and, all right. And um, actually, I'm going to ask some of my colleagues now to tell us their suggestions and maybe... Uh, who knows? Chances are uh, they can be actually incorporated into the language. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So can we start with the youngest member of this group now? Ethan, are you there? Ethan? I am here. Can you hear me? Yeah, Ethan, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Could you just give us some of the words and give us also the definitions, please? All right. First of all, again, hello. Hi there. Professor, Professor Frommer, all of you. All right, the first word was actually the one which I made up. It was actually uh, from IZ, the name of our institute. And the word is HIZ, okay? The IZ is the name of our institute, but HIZ is easier to pronounce. So HIZ can, yeah, HIZ can mean like language uh, learning or language education and Heiser can mean language teacher in Nazi. <laughs> oh, <is it? laughs> uh -huh. Heiser teacher. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. we can now also hear from other people like Mr. Really? Asadi, Ms. Karami, who had lots of suggestions last night. But Professor Framer, as I understand it, the word which uh, is entering the the language, the, the Navi language, should not exist in any other languages. Is that right? That's very, very difficult. I mean, to say that, to, to say that, that, that a word absolutely cannot exist in the other language is very restrictive. I mean, I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, I mean, I mean we have the word N-O in no. Well, N-O is also a Japanese word. And it has a totally different meaning, it's totally different function. And of course, you can come up with 10 million examples of, of, of things like this. Uh, however, if it's a longer word, then, then, then there's much less of a chance that it's going to exist in another language. That word that I gave you, the word that uh, has all those vowels together, meoni aea. That does not exist in any other language. I will bet my life on it. <laughs> so, yeah. So, yeah. But, um, but I mean, it, it's it's entirely possible that there might be a word which is good in Navi and is also good in another language. The word NGA, nga, which is a very basic word in Navi, it means you. It is also, also exists in the Maori language of New Zealand. And I believe it means, uh, means the plural. Now, when I invented Nga NGA, I didn't know that about Māori. But these things are inevitable. I mean, the, the Persian word for fish is mahi, correct? Yes, it is. Okay. Okay. 
M-A-H-I, mahi-mahi, is also a Hawaiian word for a certain kind of fish. Mm. Mahi-mahi. Um, I've asked myself, is there any connection? <laughs> I think it's a total coincidence. But coincidences like that occur. But, yeah. I mean, it, it's something which would be interesting to investigate. Sure, sure. Thank you so much. <laughs> any other uh, suggestions from uh, my friends in Isaac Education Center? Any suggestions? Mr. Asadi, are you there? I mean, you had lots of suggestions last night. Uh, all I right. Uh, uh, yes, yes. Yes, sir, I am here. Hi, Professor. Hi there. Uh, we've got many words and we suggested many words, but as you said, they are originally from Turkish and uh, we know that it is not coincidence if we just suggest it to professor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, professor. Uh, sorry for uh, interrupting. No, what, 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 what I was going to suggest is um, if someone wanted to compile a list of suggested words so I could see it in written form and um, tell me what your thinking was and tell me the meaning of the word, that would be something I'd be very happy to take a look at. Definitely. Yeah, we will do it then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that'll be, that'll be the best. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Frommer. And uh, P Professor Krashen, are you there? Uh, Professor Krashen, I think. Uh, all right. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's quarter past 11. Professor Frommer, thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. So this, much. this was one of the best days in the history of IZ Education Center. We will never I forget know. this day. We learned a lot. And like yes. I said before, now we feel connected. Yes, please. Well, yeah, fantastic. Oh, well, Professor yeah, Cashin is back. Yeah. I'm just saying good night. Good night. <laughs> it was, uh, I, I want to thank you all so much for, for uh, allowing me to. Uh, talk about Navi and, and for meeting all of you. It's been a real pleasure. And um, I hope we'll keep in touch. Thank okay. you so much. And once the situation is stable in the future, I'm looking forward to seeing you and also Professor Krash and all, and all our esteemed guests uh, in Iran. And we will surprise you with the best cuisine in Zanjan. <laughs> and oh, you will okay. have like, yeah, yeah. And of course, well, coffee definitely. and ice cream for Professor Krashen. That is something which is not negotiable. But for uh -huh. Professor Frommer, uh, I think you know a little bit of gourmet sabzi and some other food in Iran. But <laughs> Kuku sabzi. Yeah. So Kuku sabzi. Yes, yes. <laughs> Kuku sabzi. <laughs> okay. We're vegetarians. Yeah. Right. We can actually, Professor Frommer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. once again, acknowledging, uh, acknowledging the presence of yeah. Professor Krashen, Dr. Mason, Dr. Nushan Ashtari, Dr. Hassan Zadeh, and Dr. John Dahl. Thank you so much, and everyone from everywhere. It was a fascinating meeting. Have a very good time, everyone, and see you Thank soon. You. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Definitely. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Um, so I'll wait and see if everyone. Please. How about the after party? Do we have after party. <laughs> I will wait. <laughs> we usually have after parties. We're Mark, do you think I'm not leaving? Was waiting for Seema the party too. Yeah. But Seema, you you are amazing. You are amazing. I mean, the way you were talking, Navi, was like you are a native speaker of Navi. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I am, and I don't know. I have forgotten about it. They have brainwashed me, forgotten about it. But I am, maybe. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. I think I think you should you should go and work with Professor Frommer in the U.S. I mean. You've got the yeah, talent. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> this is a sign, you know? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay, now let me just stop the recording and so that we can wear our casual clothing and continue. <laughs>